Blood is a pretty important tissue, so there is much to learn about it. We are going to start with talking about components of blood. The components of blood allow blood to do its job, which is to transport nutrients and temperature and uh, chemical messengers. So um, for each of the components, you should be able to recognize them by picture, by description. You should be able to identify um, the different components of blood by characteristic and by function. So we're going to start with talking about um, the two main categories everything falls under. Everything is either plasma or a cellular component. So plasma is the liquid portion of the blood. Blood is actually a connective tissue. Connective tissue is is categorized by its matrix, extracellular, outside of the cell matrix, and the cells that live within it. So um, the plasma would be the matrix of the blood, so that's the non-living portion. Um, and then the formed elements are the cells or the cellular components. So you know red cells, white cells, and platelets. So starting with plasma, um, plasma makes up the majority of your blood. Down here you can see plasma that has been apheresed, and um, that plasma is straw in color. It makes up about 55% of your blood by volume, and the majority of that plasma is water. So about 92% of it is water, and then the next largest component would be um, within the plasma would be blood proteins. So blood also contains nutrients like glucose that we use to make energy, lipids, ions, um, so sodium and calcium we've been talking about for a few chapters with action potentials. Bicarbonate, we'll talk about that in the respiratory system. Um, gases like oxygen and CO2, that's the obvious, right? And then hormones, are chemical messengers similar to neurotransmitters, but rather than moving through the nerve cells, they're moving via blood, they're produced in a gland, and then they have a target organ, um, and at that target organ, they carry out a certain function. Um, and then those are all things that the cells need, and plasma is also going to take away wastes. Like urea, your, your cells make that. So plasma proteins, those are proteins that are not going to be taken up by cells. So they're not going to enter the cell, they're not going to be used up by the cell, they're going to stay within the plasma itself. So a couple of them you're probably familiar with, antibodies, you know, those keep us healthy, right? So those are going to fight infections. Clotting factors, you've heard of blood clot, so I'm assuming you can make that connection. These are proteins that are in the blood and they're used to make the, um, the clot that would stop bleeding. And then albumin is one I would assume that you're not as familiar with. So albumin is essential in maintaining osmotic pressure of blood. So osmotic, not so sure what does that mean. Um, hopefully you can think of the word osmosis that you learned in biology, and osmosis is the movement of water, right? So the osmotic pressure has to do the, with the pressure difference between capillaries and surrounding tissues, and that determines which direction water will move. So that's a pretty important protein. Um, so plasma is the liquid portion of the blood. Everything else falls under the category of formed elements. Formed elements are cellular um, cells or cell bits. So erythrocytes are red cells, leukocytes are white cells, and thrombocytes are your platelets, which are your clotting cells. And they're not whole cells, they're just fragments of cells. Um, you should know the scientific name and the common name, right? So erythro means red, leuco means white, thromb means clot, and cyte means cell. So you can translate those and come up with the right um, names, I'm sure. So starting with the red blood cells, we'll talk about descriptions for each of these cells. We'll talk about their functions. We might get into a little bit of statistics. So erythrocytes are unique. They have structural um, features that are unlike any other cell. For example, they are your only anucleate cells. So A is not or without, so they don't have a nucleus. Biconcave, they're like a lifesaver, so they're indented on both sides, and they're relatively fat. They're 
pretty much like bags of hemoglobin. Um, because they don't have a nucleus, they can't undergo mitosis. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus, so if you don't have a nucleus, no division happens. So that means they're not going to make more red blood cells on their own. They won't live forever. They only live about 120 days, and then they're going to be decomposed, broken apart by phagocytic cells in the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow with the iron um, and hemoglobin extracted out of them. So here's a little bit of statistics. You have about 2.5 million red blood cells being produced every single second. I would never ask you that on a test, but I think it's an interesting tidbit, so I like to tell you about it. So a little bit more about erythrocytes. I would want you to know the the um, amount, so approximately 45% of your blood is made up of red blood cells by volume. And here's another uniqueness to them. They don't have a mitochondria. Now, why would that be? The function of the red cells are to carry oxygen, right? So we know that mitochondria undergo cellular respiration and they use oxygen. So we want to transport it to cells in need. We don't want to use it. So by not having a mitochondria, the cell is able to not use the oxygen that it's carrying. By not having a nucleus, it's able to carry a ton of oxygen. So form meets function. The other piece is that it has a large surface area. So we want oxygen to be able to come and go from the cell, right? We want to tie it up and then release it where it's needed. We also want to pick up some CO2. CO2 might bind in there as well. Um, so the large surface area, again, structure meets function, makes it ideal for gas exchange. What allows it to carry oxygen is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is, anytime you see hemi, hemi you want to think of blood. Um, it's a protein that is used for carrying oxygen. Every hemoglobin molecule carries four oxygen molecules. So you have about 250 million molecules of hemoglobin in your red blood cells, and every one of those contains four oxygen molecules. So here's some math for you, right? How many oxygen molecules does every single cell carry? A billion oxygen molecules. So that's a lot of oxygen. White blood cells are pretty cool cells. You probably are familiar with um, your white blood cell count, maybe not the exact number, but the concept that when you're sick, your white blood cell count rises. So that's kind of an indicator to your doctor um, that you have an illness. And then there's a number of different types of white blood cells. And depending on what type of white blood cell is increasing in number, it can help narrow down what kind of an infection you have. So the statistics about leukocytes Leuco being white, they make up less than 1% of your blood, so way less than your red blood cells. They're the only complete cells in your blood, and that means they have all their pieces and parts. So remember, the red blood cells don't have a nucleus, and they don't have mitochondria, so they're not complete. Thrombocytes, we haven't talked about yet, they're fragments of cells. They're not even whole cells. So they're the, the white blood cells are the only cells with their nucleus and all of their organelles. Lots of lysosomes for breaking down infections. They got ribosomes for making proteins, um, Golgi apparatuses for packaging things. Um, so they're the complete cell. They're active in the lymphatic system, so they move like amoebas, right? And then they can leave the bloodstream, actually, and go out into your tissue spaces and find infectious agents or dead cells and get rid of them for you. Um, looking at our white blood cells, there are two different groups. So the first group is called granulocytes. So this group here are called granulocytes because they have lots of granules in them. So uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, when you look at them under a microscope, they have tons of little dots. And those are granules. Those granules contain something like histamine or serotonin. Um, I like to think of the end of this, 
phil, which is actually philic, and it means loving, right? Um, and, and they're actually named according to the stain that connects to them. So this is loving a basic stain and a neutral stain. But I like to say they're filled with granules. And then that is a mnemonic device so that I can remember they belong to that category. The other group would be the agranulocytes. A negates whatever comes after it, right? So they don't have granules. And these are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. So what you'll see in their cytoplasm is a lack of those dots. So that helps you identify them. So um, when we're looking at uh, white blood cells under the microscope, what we're going to want to look at, first of all, is do they have granules? So we can narrow it down to that category. The next thing we want to look at is the shape of their nucleus. So the shape of their nucleus is going to help us identify the different types of white blood cells. Starting with the neutrophils, the numerous neutrophils. So these stay neutral, that's how they get their name. Notice it, this has more than one lobe to its nucleus. Those dark purple pieces there, that's the nucleus. These are the most abundant of all your white blood cells. So if their number is rising, you got some kind of um, sickness. They're active phagocytes. Phagocytosis, remember, is engulfing and then eating um, of cells. So phage is to eat and cell is sight, right? So they're eating cells. So they might have anywhere from two to seven lobes, more common two to five. Um, and what we mean is this, this is all one nucleus and you can see there's portions of it. So it comes in lobes. So um, white blood cells, that's gonna be in your infections. So it's present at your wounds. Um, eosinophils. They stain with a chemical called eosin, which is acidic. And so that's how they got their name. Um, they're bilobed. I like to think they look like headphones. Um, so you can see here the bilobe, two lobes. And over here, my students made these with clay. Um, and they're, they have lots of granules, and they're active in parasitic infection. So they kill parasitic worms um, and they will also increase during aller allergy attacks because they're trying to offset the allergic reaction. Um, they're not causing the inflammation, they're trying to do the exact opposite. So eosin, so I need a mnemonic for each of these cells. So I know a pinworm is a common little worm that maybe kids get into um, because of the dirt and they get it under their fingernails. Anyways, pin, sin, they rhyme. So eosinophils kill parasitic worms. Okay, basophils, they stain with a basic stain, thus the base, right? And if you look at this, it just looks like a whole bunch of purple dots, right? I can't even see hardly the nucleus inside. So this one is really filled with coarse granules of histamine, which we've learned before is a vasodilator. So there's where my inflammation is coming into play, and serotonin. Um, so that's what we get in those granules. And here you can see those big granules. So um, hypersensitivity, that's a fancy word of saying allergies. So basophils are your least common white blood cells. I always like the biggest, the smallest, the most, the least, um, and these are the least uh, common. My mnemonic is just the S there. Histamine and basophils both have an S. Um, and so that's... So the granulocytes have those coarse granules, and A granulocytes do not have granules. So you can see right here uh, the dark purple nucleus, but then a clear uh, cytoplasm outside of it. And mostly these are your lymphocytes. Um, there's two different types of lymphocytes, B and T cells. A granulocytes, this is actually your second most common white blood cell. So you know you have your neutrophils are the most common, and then you have your um, A granulocytes, which are your lymphocytes and um, monocytes. So the lymphocytes are the B, the T, and here's a picture of those, and I wouldn't expect that you can tell the difference between the two. Pretty much their nucleus is circular in shape and a very small rim of cytoplasm on the outside. These aren't very large cells, compare them to the red blood cell over here. They're smaller than your other white blood cells, so you can identify them that way as well. So B cells are made in your bone marrow. They mature in the bone marrow, and then they produce antibodies that will identify um, foreign invaders. 
and target them for destruction. T cells will leave the bone marrow where they're made and they migrate to your thymus gland where they mature and they get their immunocompetency. And so they're able to identify foreign invaders and then they can, um, they go out into your tissue spaces and kill um, the cells that are infected. Natural killer cells, these are going to um, specifically target cells of yours that are infected by viruses. So the T cell and the natural killer cell, they're killing your cell in order to kill um, the foreign invaders. So they don't kill the invader directly. The other granulocyte, or a granulocyte, sorry, is a monocyte. So we recognize it by its kidney bean shape. It's also the largest of our white blood cells. Um, so that kidney bean, you might also consider it horseshoe shaped, I guess, depending on um, your background, right? So these are active phagocytes that become macrophages. So they live in your bloodstream for about three days and then they leave. It's called diapedesis when white cells are able to like squeeze through the pores in your capillaries. Um, so they squeeze out of those dilated blood vessels and they go out into um, the tissue spaces and they start becoming a cleanup crew basically. So macrophages get an insatiable appetite and they eat just all they can eat. Um, so this is a long-term cleanup crew. Chronic infections are infections that just won't go away, right? You have acute infections that are like here and now and then chronic that is really lasting. Like sometimes I get bronchitis and it lasts forever. And that would be an example of chronic infection. So um, the monocytes are gonna be out and about for that. And what they're going to do, so they're phagocytes, they're going to engulf that cell, and then pieces of the foreign cell makes their way to the outside membrane, and like proteins are gonna stick to the outside of the macrophage, and then they're going to present it to B and T cells, so B and T cells can learn what that foreign protein is. And again, we'll talk more about that in the immune system. So the final, so we had plasma liquid. We have red cells being the most common cellular component. White cells come next. And then finally you have platelets. And platelets, they come from a megakaryocyte. So this cell gets really big and karyo is referring to nucleus, right? So lots and lots of nuclei in the inside. And then it's just fragmenting. Pieces of it are coming off. And those pieces are platelets. So the platelets are also called thrombocytes, and they're needed to start the whole clotting cascade. So they're going to call other cells to the area to clot, and, um, and they're going to collect protein threads that are in your blood cells, and they're going to stick to the collagen that is in the torn capillary that is causing you to bleed. And so they're going to then create the final blood clot. And you got a whole lecture on that another day too. So, um, so that is called hemostasis. So lectures to come, we have hematopoiesis, formation of all of the different cells. Hemostasis, the clotting of blood. Genetics of blood, so why do you have A blood or O blood? And blood typing, who can give to whom and why? So that's something to look forward to. Thanks for listening.